This is a photo from an article I did, oh, I'm going to say around 2008 for Fly Anglers Online. And uh, the fly is named for S.S. Hamlin, who was a fly fisherman featured in a really cool book called Bodines, or Camping on the Lycoming. The book is by Thaddeus S. Upton de Graff, MD. That's quite a mouthful. And it's it's a real hoot and a holler. Uh, basically, it's a detailed account of a camping trip, or maybe several trips blended into one long narrative, made by de Graff and his partner in crime, Hamlin, um, to the wilds of Pennsylvania in the 1870s. De Graff was from uh, Elmira, New York, and uh, it was about 51 miles, a 51 mile trip, which in those days was quite a trip. But in the book, DeGraff says they took a train from Elmira to Ralston. Ralston must have been a stop on the line. It's a little strange because these days there's not much there in Ralston. It, in any case, um, the, the camping that was done in those days was fascinating. First of all, you, you made your own tent. If you wanted to take a boat on the trip, you made the boat. And he made his boat out of, uh, I guess we would call it tin, tin now, galvan galvanized uh, iron sheets. And uh, he shows how to make the boat in the book. It's, it's a fascinating look at, at how things were done in those days. It's also just a beautifully written book. And of course, back in the 1800s, people could really write. And let me just give you a, a short example of some of the uh, hyperbole and, and prose dis describing the fishing they encounter. Here it goes. Uh, Floating listlessly along in the cool shade of the great mountain, how peacefully quiet is all nature about us. Not a breath of air ruffles the fair pool or disturbs a leaf on the hillside. Even the birds are quiet, for they too are taking their evening siesta. Silently the shadows are creeping up the sides of the western mountain, the somber hues below intensifying the brilliancy of the grand old hemlocks lighted up with the golden rays of the setting sun. Soon they too fall into shadow, and then we bestir ourselves to throw for the large trout. Now upon the lookout for the multitudes of flies and moths that disport themselves upon the surface of the water as the evening shadows entice them out. We've not long to wait, for just under a shelving rock a bright fox has fallen into the water, and is flapping his gauzy wings right vigorously to regain the airy regions. Immediately we see a boiling in the smooth water, which sends out circle after circle of gentle, gentle wavelets until broken against the sides of our canoe. I turn the bow, and with a light sweep of the paddle, place my companion within reaching distance of the spot. One throw of his graceful line, and before the deceptive fly fairly lights upon the water, the old trout has left his retreat and bounded into the air, grasping the morsel within his jaws. De Graff gives recipes for uh, both the bright fox and the hamlet, as mo uh, among other flies in the book. Uh, but the bulk of the book, it, I think, is a little bit more about the camping than it is the fishing. But they do plenty of fishing in the book all around uh, the area of like Cumming Creek, the Loyal Sock, uh, fishing on the Pine. Uh, it's a great book about uh, fishing that whole area in uh, northeastern Pennsylvania. But the real fun in the book involves the hijinks these guys get into. And here's a, uh, an illustration from the book of Hamlin uh, hooking and not landing a deer. 
Uh, and if I didn't have a friend, and he'll, he'll remain nameless, uh, Bruce Copeland, who did this sort of thing all the time himself, I might not have believed this, but uh, yeah, Hamlin hooks a deer just for fun uh, to see if he can do it, and the deer takes off and takes his fly line with him, serving Hamlin right. So a few years went by, and I decided I needed to go and fish Lycoming Creek. I couldn't take it anymore. And I contacted Don Bastion, and Don was very gracious and invited me to his farm in, in the area. And I uh, spent a few days fishing with Don, and um, he showed me all around. He, he, he knew, knows the area like the back of his hand. He grew up there. In case you don't know who Don Bastion is, Don did all the wet flies in the fantastic book, Forgotten Flies. Just a beautiful fly tire. Um, I'm going to link to some things uh, to Don's blog and uh, his his video below. Much of what I do, I got from Don as far uh, concerning wet flies in general. We do a couple things differently, but uh, I... I've learned a lot from Don over the years. And uh, in any case, we had a lot of fun. And one of the parts of the book that struck me was the chapter entitled Ralston. And I desperately wanted to go and fish Rock Run, or at least see it, because it's described with all sorts of hyperbole in the book. And sure enough, the place was gorgeous. Don and I drove up. You drive up the side of a mountain on a dirt road. You start at the bottom of the mountain in, in Ralston itself, which is basically a convenience store. And you drive up, oh, two or three miles, and ultimately you come to a bridge. And I have I took some shots up there. Um, there are two waterfalls, one above, which here's a shot of that. And then one below, and there's a shot of that. Um, and then uh, we we spent some, spent a lot of time there. And then on on the way back, Don stopped at a at a kind of a pull off, not too far from the bridges, where a trail went down to an area that people fished all the time. And sure enough, there were all sorts of rising trout there. And here are those shots. If you, if you look at the big rock in the middle, um, and just look in front of it, you'll see a rise. I didn't have a telephoto lens, so I've had to enlarge this a bit. But you can see there's a trout rise in there, and they're, they're brook trout. Up there, and there's they're pretty much stocked at this point. Um, the creek is not very fertile because it's all rock and it's fairly the elevation's fairly high, so uh, they do a lot of stocking. And there were all kinds of guys fishing up there, a lot of bait fishermen. But uh, as it turned out, after I decided not to fish. Um, it had been quite a hike to get down in there, and uh, we didn't have rods with us. And we hiked back up, and Don tried to encourage me to go back down with my small Hamlin's uh, number 16s I had tied for the trip, and and try for those rising fish. But I just I thought better of it. I I just decided to leave the the fish alone. And there are times when you should do that, and this was certainly one of those times. So we got in the Jeep to head back, and this happened. It wouldn't start, and uh, I had visions of, of making a two-mile trek down to Ralston, but a kindly bait fisherman picked us up and uh, took us down there, and Don called his friend, and uh, we still couldn't get it going, but at least we had a ride back to Don's place. That's Don in the blue. 
I did fish like Coming Creek with Don a couple days, which was a blast. Um, I really enjoyed watching Don roll cast. He's an amazing roll caster and can roll cast all the way across like Coming Creek. And there, there are places where you definitely need to do that. Fortunately, the second day, um, we, we fished a place where you could get a back cast. And uh, I did a little better there. This is, was one time in my life where the, the fantasy I had built up in my mind over a period of years, the, the reality matched it. It's an utterly beautiful area. And if you get a chance to fish like Cumming Creek or any of the other rivers in the vicinity, you absolutely should do it. So now let's tie a Hamlin. This is the version of the Hamlin found in J. Edson Leonard's Flies. The only difference between it and DeGraff's version is this has a... Uh, a gold flat tinsel tag. Other than that, it's, it's identical. Take the thread all the way back to the bend. Leave a little space up front behind the eye just to keep the size of the head down. This is flat gold tinsel, metal, small. Bind it down with about six turns forward. And then as you, as you wind five turns back, let them slide off the previous wind. And that way they'll be nice and close together. So it's five turns back and then five turns back forward. Unwind the thread. That keeps bulk down at the uh, at the tie-in point of the tinsel. Bind it down with oh, you know, at least five turns. Stagger cut it. Try to keep it underneath the shank as you uh, bind it down forward. I don't completely succeed in that, but it'll work. Take the thread all the way back right to the tinsel. I'm going to tie in a tail, and this tail is made from uh, mallard feathers, not the blue ones. There, there are black ones and there are blue ones. These are black ones. And uh, the slips are about four or five uh, strands wide. One from a, a left mallard wing and one from a right mallard wing. Tie right on top of the hook, but but straddle the hook slightly so that they're sort of tented against each other. Go all the way up to where you started the thread and then all the way back. And at this point, it's not clear what you should use. Um, I use a couple of strands of heron here because heron was used a lot back in those days, but it's not well defined. It just sort of says black quill. This is this is um, these are two strands from a uh, heron quill feather, wing feather, if you will. But you could use. Um, goose secondaries, if they, if you have, if you've got a good long piece, cut a couple of those strands. Should be 
dark gray or black. This will look black once it's done. It looks very light gray here, but it's it's really not. It's best if you can not use hackle pliers to do this, but it got it's sh it was short enough that I had to go with the hackle pliers. It's much better if you can if you can wind this by hand and let the strands slip through your fingers because these strands will break very easily. Trap the butts a couple times. Trim them. I use black hen saddle feathers here. Any black hen will work. Try to um, adjust the tie-in point, you're going to tie in by the tip, try to adjust it so that the fibers will reach the point of the hook when you're done winding. It's That's just a ballpark. It doesn't have to be exact. And, and I don't think this is quite. This might be a touch long. We'll see how it pans out here. Fold the feathers back and I just I just fold them back as I wind. So much easier to do it this way than try to fold them ahead of time. They can be folded ahead of time if you so desire. Many tires did that. And when you get done, you hold the uh, butts up, take a turn, and uh, make sure you keep tension on the thread, and then pull the, st the stem forward. And that'll get most of the fibers out of the way, so when you cut it off, it'll be clean. It's never 100% clean, rarely, but... I think I've got one stray here, which isn't too bad. Actually, it looks like the thread has, like a couple strands of the thread have broken here. I'll fix that later, maybe off camera. If that happens, what I'll do is I'll, I'll weight it down typically with hackle pliers and then tie in a new piece of thread starting at the eye and just bind over everything. Right now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bind the hackle down just a little bit. I just want to do it enough so that the, the uh, fibers don't stick up above the equator of the hook or uh, above the top of the hook, certainly. I don't want any fibers in the way when I go to mount the wing. Okay, I, here I've, I've repaired that uh, piece of thread. I'm gonna mount the wing. The more slowly you crush these fibers down, the better. The thing that I typically struggle with on mounting a wing is I don't get the far wing far enough over. It needs to definitely straddle the far side of the hook. Many times, for whatever reason, that doesn't happen for me.
Hopefully it happens for you. At this point, I, I twist the thread counterclockwise, or I'm sorry, clockwise a lot, as if I'm screwing in a light bulb. Um, and that's to make the thread strong. I really want to twist it up so that I can use a lot of force on this next, as I go back up the head. As you can see, I've got a little shelf there that's, going to be a problem and that happens I'm going to try to cover it with the whip finish but as you can see it slides down again so I'll try another whip try to get it with this one you know it covers initially and then it slides one more try We'll get as close as we can get. If I had waxed the thread before doing this, it might have helped. Possibly. But this will work. I'll get it glued up. Here's the finished fly. I would have liked a darker body, but... Uh, that's okay. Other than that, I'm reasonably happy. I still like the one I did for Fly Anglers Online a few years ago better, but you can't have everything. Have fun with this one.